Welcome to the Digital Agency Growth Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Englander. Today on the show, I'm very excited to welcome Mike Brevik. Mike is a brand and marketing strategist who partners with startups and well-established companies to grow their professional brands. With 20 plus years in the print, creative, and marketing industry, Mike's been over a decade of that time leading and building e-commerce solutions, social media strategies, and everything in between for two of the Midwest's largest retailers. Building relationships is key to Mike's approach and has enabled him to work with several premier brands from Nike to Jordan to Under Armour to Harley Davidson and many more along the way. Mike, nice to have you on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Appreciate it as well. And brand is one of these things that a lot of people talk about. And one question I like to ask is just, what's your definition of brand? Like, what does that mean to you? A lot of people get it confused with the logo itself. Not that a logo isn't a, a component of the brand, but imagine the brand is, to put it in an example, the brand is the soup necessarily. And the ingredients that go in that soup could be the voice, the website, the logo. Maybe it's even a smell. It could be a packaging. All those things collectively is what builds up to a brand and and what makes that important is a brand should be an experience. It should be something that you can feel. It should be something that is intuitive to what it's like to work with a certain company or a person. If there's a brand kind of awareness, there should be a feeling and an experience that comes with that. Yeah. And I I think a lot of the times when people hear about brand, it seems like it's further up in the Maslow's hierarchy of need, right? Like if you're, yeah. if we're talking to agency owners, they're thinking, I need leads. I need to figure out my new business system. I need to figure out this tactical issue. And then probably the same thing goes for a lot, unless you're at like a bigger consumer level, probably if you're dealing with growth stage companies, they probably have similar concerns, not to say that they're right. So I guess when you're encountering that, how do you make brand take on the significance that it should, if that question makes sense? Like, how do you make the brand priority come lower down or higher up in like the the order of priorities? Because branding is one of these items that it's, it's less tactical and it's less measurable. It's something that gets easily disregarded in the process. So a lot of times, even if you start with the intention of brand and you you kind of think you know what that is, when you start to get in the weeds of business and you're looking at ROI and leads and all these things that are a little bit more black and white and a little bit more conclusive, it easily just falls to the wayside. It, it finds its way to the back burner pretty quick. So when we're working with clients, we try to make them hyper aware and also to keep it on their radar that all of these different things, including the brand, it's a process of connecting dots and consistency that the brand is not only present in these other efforts, but that it's factored in as part of the overall success or failure of. So when we work with clients, it's just something that never leaves our conversation because it's never a box that can be checked. It's forever part of the equation and part of that recipe. Are there ever situations where you tell prospects or clients, hey, brand's important, but it's not the most important thing for you yet. You should focus on these other things first and worry about brand later. Or is it always there? Even if you're day one, you you can work with a client. Not only is it always there, it's always one of the most important things and one of the things that you should address, if not from the onset, as soon as you possibly can. So I look at a brand as, you know, just like you would as a person that that first impressions matter, right? So when you go out and meet somebody, you don't necessarily walk in there and you know what, I'm not feeling it today. So I'm just going to give you whatever version of myself I feel like giving you. And maybe the fifth or sixth time I, I meet you, I might decide to show you the version of myself that you really want to see. Well, by that fifth or sixth time, it's too late. You can't undo what you did up to that point. Or if you can, it's going to take you twice as long to erase that experience up to that point to show them who you want to be or who you aspire to be as a person. So it's the same for branding. The sooner you do it, the better off you're going to be. And and really look at it like every day is an opportunity for you to give somebody your first or best impression. Put your brand out there strong, put it out there often and put it out there the way you want it to be received. Because the other thing I get thrown at sometimes is they want to put it in a progressional way that I don't know if we're at the point where I need to worry about that. And it's like, well, how do you graduate to the point where it matters? You don't. 
it should be there from the very beginning. And then you backfill your services, your delivery, like you should be building up to what that aspiring vision is so that people start to become accustomed with where you want this whole thing to go, which is that brand representation. Right. That makes sense. And with that in mind, can you talk a little bit more about how you're working with clients? Like what do the services actually look like? I think when people hear about make money, make a good impression. Yeah, that that's agreeable. Like everybody would want that. But if you're doing that through content, people are thinking about it through content marketing, or if you're doing that through a podcast, it could be thought leadership. Like where does, for you, like where does your work start and where does it, where does it end? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it kind of depends that we, we meet the clients where they're at. So we get clients that come to us with a blank canvas and we help them craft that entire strategy and that plan and, and the list of executables that they need to hit over the course of time, 12 to 18 months, whatever it is. But we also sometimes meet clients where it's, it's a calibration, you know, maybe they started out of the gate strong and over time and and just the process of wearing too many entrepreneurial hats, they backburnered the brand or they kind of forgot its importance. And now they're worried about payroll and invoicing and they just kind of lost their way. So we step in and kind of do a recalibration of sorts. And then we have startups that say, Hey, I got this vision for this business, I, I, but I don't even know where to start. And we will work with them from kind of a cultivation standpoint as to how to build that narrative and kind of find something that's truly authentic to them. Now, that said, we do, from an executable standpoint, we will do the brand build out. So the logo, the voice, the strategy, all those types of things, and then start to backfill it with where their business needs to go from website to social media to graphic design. We, we kind of backfill those services to help them make sure they have enough tools in their toolbox to do their job. But for us, that that brand is always kind of the lifeblood that runs through those different things. Not only because I think it's important for the clients, but it really makes our jobs easier as marketers, knowing that they have a plan and they have a direction for their brand and how we can interweave that throughout all those assets. Yeah. And to, to talk, to dig more and hopefully like steel man the case for branding. So I'm not just challenging you for no reason. I just want to make your case strong. If, if I'm listening to this and I'm a boutique agency owner, or maybe I'm the CMO of like a growth stage CPG company and everything I do is measured, right? And all of my outputs are measured and I'm going to maybe get fired or maybe not be successful if I don't hit these goals in this amount of time. And then somebody makes the case for branding and says, you can't measure it. Why should I continue to prioritize branding? Like what's, what's the argument there and how do I even know if I'm successful? Well, there's two arguments. One is that it's not an either, or you don't choose one over the other. They should be working together. And the second part of that is, is that, and I've seen this be true and, and I've, fully believe this. The brand is something that should be developed from the onset, but always developed in conjunction and in step and in stride with all those other efforts, whether it's paid ads or or writing a book or email campaigns or whatever it is you're doing. But all these things should be kind of being developed together and in in conjunction with one another so that when tough times hit and you need to cut back on some costs and you need to reduce the amount of ads you're running and the budgets are getting smaller, the foundation of your brand, the loyalty of your customers and the strength that you have built up just in that one kind of silo can sustain you through tough times. But at at minimum, it's going to give you a good sense of where your basement is and where you need to kind of come back and, and kind of set reserves and regroup from. If you have no consistency in brand and you've not really spent any time trying to build it, or if you've put yourself in the position to believe it's an either or you have no place to go back to, to regroup because when the ads stop, and I see this a lot with clients where it's like, so if I stop spending on my ads, what happens? Well, probably all your results go with it. Unless you've got a brand following, you've got some brand customer loyalty established and that you found a way to build up some kind of a pipeline there where people like you because of you, because of your brand, because of what you stand for, like all these different things. So it's important to do both. It's important to make sure that those things are being developed together. 
Yeah, makes sense. To shift gears a little bit, I know that you deal with a word that I haven't thought about in a while. You ever come across one of these phrases that you're just like, I haven't thought about that word in a while or that jargon. And uh, it's guerrilla marketing. And I was like, I saw that and I was like, when was the last time I heard that? It must have been like the early 2000s or something. And I know that it exists. I know people like rationally, like intellectually, I know people are doing it. But it's like, huh, why is like, first of all, do you do you agree with that? Do you think that guerrilla marketing is like something that used to be bigger and is diminished? And what does it mean now? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was I think it went through its phase where it was kind of a buzzword. It was kind of something that people it was kind of cool to be a guerrilla marketer and whatnot. And it fizzled out and was replaced with other buzzwords like authenticity and things like that. So I think they all kind of go through their cycles. I personally, the idea of guerrilla marketing, I just think it's timeless. I think flipping over rocks to see what's underneath it and to take swings and to try things and you don't know the the answer to a question until you ask. It's kind of a risk mindset where you got to put yourself out there and just be aggressive with it. I think it's super important. And I think for any entrepreneur or business owner, it might be in the 20%, but I think you should be doing it on a regular basis. I think it's important. What is it? Like, what is grill marketing to you? Grill marketing to me is finding the the less traditional ways to get to your end result. And whether that means jumping back to a form of marketing that has since been called outdated, maybe it's, you know, in, in, a, in a radical case, maybe it's skydiving from an airplane and dropping 10,000 flyers on a community. Like it's a broad range of what you could possibly do with it. But I think being unique is the point. Finding a way to punch through the white noise, that's the goal of guerrilla marketing because in the traditional sense, you're competing, right? You're always trying to compete for audience. You're competing for ROI. You're basically standing toe to toe with your competitors, which a lot of times you, you might be outnumbered because maybe their budget's 10 times what yours is, or maybe like there's a lot of reasons where it can be an unfair game. So instead of trying to compete in something like that, what if we took our efforts and if we, what if we just did something that was really unique, almost a little strange to a degree? What if we did something like that to see if we couldn't rattle loose a few leads or a few connections? That's the kind of mindset and the creative kind of entrepreneurship that I think people need to start thinking about. And, but keep it reserved. Like, don't do that 80% of the time and expect great results. You got, you have to be well thought out and strategic, but try stuff. You got to experiment a little bit to see what works. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think that as digital has just become, has gotten bigger, it's kind of created this tunnel vision with, with what's available where it's like LinkedIn, Facebook, Google, one or two other things I'm probably forgetting right now. And then traditional, which we, you just assume, oh, only people above 80, 70 <laughs> consume this, right? I guess with that in mind, anything you can talk about, any stories or case studies for grill marketing that you, you've seen work these days, your clients are beyond. I'll give you a couple of personal ones, but what I've seen my clients do, and even I've done myself, is you just reach up, whether whether you're embarrassed by it or whether it's even a fully flushed out idea. I think sometimes we have this idea that if it's not presentation worthy, I, I probably should just keep it to myself. Well, what happens is, is those ideas, you know, you're kicking that can down the road and you never do it. It never happens. Well, be strategic, be smart, but take that idea, write it out in an email or whatever it is you're going to do and decide, is, is this something worth exploring? And if it is, who should I explore it with? And then when you figure that out, well, how should I deliver it to them? Should I just send it an email or should I put it in some wacky, cool package or should I send them 10 pizzas with a note in it, or should I send them like, start to think through the delivery mechanism on how you can just get their attention yeah. and then do it, see what happens. And I, I think the people that do that, you know, like what, what's your measure of success for me? A lot of times it's like, if I do something crazy like that, or if I do something out of the box like that, I don't need, like, let's just say I send it to 10 people, whatever that idea is. I don't need all 10 people to respond to me. I only need one of them to respond to me for me to feel like it worked. So that's kind of my metric. So I'm going to send them out to 10 people. And if I get one, I'm good. Well, if I get none, then 
maybe I didn't send it to enough people. Maybe I didn't like, that's how I kind of look at it. Like if you don't ask the question, you'll never get the answer, but you also have to go where these people are at and not be afraid to ask the question. The worst that's going to happen is you're either going to get ignored or you're going to get a thanks, but no thanks. Either way, you're not really out that much other than the idea or the effort that went into it. So again, I think it's important to at least to start with, to think that way, kick over a few rocks to see what's underneath it. And if you want to pursue it further than that, just don't be afraid of failure because you only need, like I said, you only need one out of 10 to, to make it worth it. Yeah. And to shift gears a little bit, there's a lot of different agency owners listening that have built have, have drastically different goals for their shops. Some people are trying to build out a more leveraged model. Others like with a handful of clients, all different sizes of agency. Can you talk about that a little bit for what it means for for your organization? Or like, are you, what are you trying to build? If you don't mind me asking. A couple things. We have two basic versions of how we handle our customers. We have a retainer based model, and that's to give us time to work with these customers, to build relationships and to do things over the course of time, because we know that marketing is progressional. It does take time. And the longer we can basically work with them and spend time with them, the better we get to know them and the better we get to know their business and their strategy. And it just, it makes us a little bit more uh, unified and closer on that overall direction. So the retainer model for us is a huge one. And then we have our project clients and basically that is they come and go as they please. They show up when they need something. It might be a website, it might be a logo, it might be graphic design, whatever it is, but then they, they go about their day and they come back, you know, a month or six months later for whatever they need next, because they're just a different style of company or their process is a little different. So that said, for us, it's, that's our 80%. So I have kind of this 80, 20 rule that I run my business with and 80% of the time is, yeah, we have to, we have to make payroll. We have to make money to pay the bills and we have to kind of have this stable existence that is kind of falls within this this traditional agency model however in the in the 20% that's where i try to be creative and i try to do things that selfishly fill my cup and and how do we find more people like us and how do we think outside the box and how do we do stuff that doesn't make sense how do we find opportunities where nobody else is looking like so we we have these two mindsets that we're constantly running with and the 80% feeds and basically finances the 20% now, that said, my goal for CyberDogs is I want us to disrupt the the entire industry of marketing. I want us to be the in some ways the anti-agency in the fact that we're not following all the same rules as most traditional agencies because we're trying to carve this new path and have fun with it and and really come up with something unique and build this community of people around us that think the same way. And first and foremost, we're trying to create a brand and, and an experience. We're, we're deeply rooted in branding and relationships with our clients, but if they don't have a good experience or if they don't come out of this thing feeling like the cyber dogs version or the cyber dogs way of things changed my life, then we're not doing it right. So we're always trying to kind of cultivate what that looks like and how do we create more impact for more people? Yeah, it makes sense. And to dig into that a little bit, how are you identifying talent? How are you identifying those people that are going to shake things up or fit with your culture. And can you talk about your hiring process a little bit? Yeah, pe people are tough. Everybody comes into a, a job interview with their best foot forward. So that's kind of where the process starts. We got to kind of punch through that filter. But where we've found success is we find people that, you know, they have a certain amount of belief in them, the uh, trust. They have to kind of be wide-eyed to this idea of possibility. They have to be kind of ready to do things that are unconventional and and sometimes break down the traditional process and and ask yourself, well, is there a better way? Like, I know this is how they taught me in school and I know this is how they taught me at my previous agency, but what if none of those options were available and you had to do it by yourself from scratch and you had to do it differently? What would you do? Like those people that can kind of confront those challenges and come up with something unique or special that's huge because you can lay that on top of the traditional or replace it with either way. We need to be able to think like that for our customers because we're on the hook for their success in a lot of scenarios. So 
if they're not going to bring it that way, then we need to be supplementing with that kind of mindset. Yeah, makes sense. Subject changed a little bit. One thing you you covered that's interesting is the idea of leveraging nostalgia in, in modern marketing. And this, this is something that jumped out at me because I feel like nostalgia is having a moment. And I don't know how old you are, but like with millennials, with people about my age, it's it seems like it's there all the time in marketing. Part of me gets it because I think part of me is attracted to it. And then another part of me is pretty depressed by it because it sort of feels regressive or something. How do you feel about nostalgia? I think one of the reasons why nostalgia is making a kind of a trendy return is the fact that whether people break it down this way or not, it makes them feel a certain way. It makes them reminisce. It makes them appreciate. It makes them possibly admire certain times and eras. Like I I think it's all about how nostalgia makes us feel and feelings are a very powerful part of branding. And how I would translate that into kind of using nostalgia as a tool within branding. My idea is that entrepreneurs and business owners out there, when we start a business, we come out of the gate hot and we have a excitement and an exuberance about us where we're pumped about this business. We're probably the most optimistic in our business we've ever been. And we're jacked to get started and the possibilities are endless. Well, then after year one, year two, year three, year four, and so on, you start to wear these different hats. Now you're the accountant, now you're HR, now you're sales, and you start to get bogged down with all the different things that come with owning a business. And all of a sudden, it's you're not as optimistic, you're not as fired up, you're not as entrenched in that feeling anymore because you've got a million things to do. And not that you do it intentionally, but it just naturally gets sucked out of you, right? My idea is you got to covet and hang on to that excitement and ride that train throughout the entire entrepreneurial journey because not only are you the face of the business, but you're the one teaching the new people coming in. If you don't have that excitement and that belief and that optimism, they're not going to either. And all of this directly comes out of you and, and kind of it's part of your sales process. It's part of your voice and your cadence and your kind of your culture that's just kind of oozing out of you as you meet with people and build partnerships and these kinds of things. So to covet that and and make sure that that never goes away is huge. And to me, that's that kind of nostalgic, kind of that brand retro process that you have to really hang on to. Like one of the questions I ask a lot of people is, do you remember one of the best Christmases you ever had as a kid? Do you do you remember? Uh not one in particular, but <laughs> but you, you do remember that as a kid, Christmas yeah. has hit different, right? Right. They don't hit the same as they do today. Well, but what if they could? What if you could sustain that and carry that forward to your adult? I, I would want to feel that every Christmas, wouldn't you? Yeah. So you so if I understand right, you're thinking of nostalgia on like a micro level, like on an individual person's level as opposed to like a a macro era sort of level when when it when it applies sure but but yeah really it's more about the feeling of it's more about that experience of and don't get me wrong if you can learn from the past and bring parts of that into your own brand and your marketing plan i think it's huge it's trendy and it's smart but what you're real what people kind of forget about marketing is that so much of it is a feeling and it's subliminal it's not always black and white and direct and in your face. It's about the feeling you can put inside that person that they walk away with that makes them remember you. Yeah, that makes sense. And when it comes to engendering feelings and stuff through branding, is there anything that you've picked up on that's counterintuitive that most people wouldn't notice? Something that, you know, most people would would zig when you guys zag, right? Like something that where you wouldn't think this would work out that way, but it does. Rory Sutherland talks a lot about this. So does Cialdini through like various experiments they've done. Um, I was just wondering if there's anything like that, not to put you on the spot, but no, like I think one of the most obvious things and let me know if this doesn't answer your question, but like, I think as business owners and even as even companies that are looking to like do things like this, we always run a pretty tight ship and a tight budget when it comes to like trade shows, swag at conferences and things like that. So like the pens, the stress balls, the, the different things that 
we're looking at those items as throwaway items and we try to we try to be cheap about it like can i get ten thousand of these for x y and z price like that's just kind of how we've been operated to kind of understand and to kind of process those types of things where i look at those types of things and go well what if we got less but made them nicer and then sent them home with the idea that these things aren't disposable and they actually keep them around so spend more money on the quality get less stuff and make sure that somebody says i'll never throw this pen away because it's awesome and here's why and they'll probably tell 10 people about it same with hats same with clothing whether it's stickers or whatever it is you're doing i know budgets are a real thing and and yes sometimes we have to adhere to them to be smart business people but we need to think about the follow through the journey and kind of what we expect out of these items if we're truly going to just buy 10,000 pens for 10 cents a piece, don't waste your money because they're all going to end up in the garbage anyway. That's just one of those things where I just look at it differently and say, I encourage you to spend more on stuff that matters. Like send them home with a reason to never throw it away or to keep you on their radar. Yeah, that's cool. And, and while you were saying that, I was you asked me for an example and I thought of a couple one from our travels, another from an expert's. I'll start with the expert, which is, which is Rory Sutherland, who I just mentioned. I just heard him on like Chris Williamson's show. He was talking about how they did a massive test because they're measuring everything. They're doing this, but they're also like measuring it because they're Ogilvy and they can do these massive direct mail campaigns from back in the day. And they did it for a charity donation for some big charity. And the quality of the paper, the heavier, thicker paper, didn't lead to more donations, but it led to higher donations, right? So you could probably work backwards. I don't know if they did this and say, well, you could spend more on the paper, but you could also actually spend less in the long run because you would spend more time targeting only the people that have the propensity to make bigger donations, right? So that's one thing that comes to mind. I think from our travels, like a lot of it informs our outreach strategy and like our zigging when other people zag is most people assume that when they're doing outreach for sales reasons, you have to make some sort of like left brain business case, right? And you have to talk about the exact business problem you're going to solve and so on. When really the thing that's building relationships is trust. We talk a lot about this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is stuff that is emotional and does create a feeling. Like most common one is who do you know that's in your backyard, right? That's like within a 10 mile radius of you that could do business with you, even though it has nothing rational to do with the job you're going to do, because most of our clients are dealing with remote work. It matters so much in terms of getting meetings and closing business. It's, just, it's not the only thing, but it's one, it's one tactical thing. So that jumps out of me. Yeah. And, and a lot of times it's just thinking a little bit more abstract, but it's, it's thinking beyond that first or second layer, because at the end of the day, like just, I'll put it in like a keyword example. Like a lot of times when we go into a paid ads perspective, we want to money at the best keyword because it's the best keyword, right? Like if this is the most X, Y, and Z keyword in the whole campaign that I want to throw all my money there. And it's like, okay, but that's also where everybody else is competing. So like, there's a reason why it's the most expensive keyword because everybody else is competing for it. And you will deplete your, your budget faster chasing that keyword than you would anything else. What if we looked at the bottom 10? What if we took the top 10 keywords and went from the bottom up and said, A, I can stretch my budget on the on the bottom half of that list, but also what if it garnished me better results or a higher pool of prospects? And then re in reality, how many of those do I really need to convert to make this whole thing worth it? Because if I can get that from the bottom half of the list, and not the top, then why wouldn't I do that? And when you break that down for clients, in most cases, it's like, yeah, that makes sense. But intuitively, because we're all wired this way, we all want to jump to the top of the list and compete there. And not to say we can't work towards that, but if, again, if you're a business owner, you're working on a limited budget, or if you're trying to be strategic with your dollars, that's probably not where you should start. You should start with that. Like, let's look at the bottom half of the list, or let's figure out where in this list we can get the same results at a lower cost, regardless as to where it fits in the whole hierarchy provided to us by Google or whoever. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Another topic that you cover that kind of reminds me a little of guerrilla marketing, although it's not quite there yet, is the idea of, of viral content, right? Which was like something that I remember from the 2010s being a thing that you could maybe achieve as a business, right? Which is virality. And then I think since then, the competition for attention and the the lack of shared experience and the niching and everything has made that very difficult to achieve to the point where it might not even be worth the input to get the output. <laughs> but I, I know you focus on it. So to ask the question, what does viral content mean for you in the year 2024? And how are you helping clients get there? Yeah. And, and just to add on something you said there that why it can, you know, continues to get more difficult is that the platforms themselves, Facebook, Google, whatever, they figure out where their loopholes are. They complicate it to monetize it further and therefore going viral or, or these things that used to work that now all of a sudden don't are because the platforms are, are manipulating things behind the scenes to figure out how to kind of push their own agenda and or to monetize it. So it, it constantly changes. Plus the trends change. And I mean, it's a moving landscape of variables, but you always have to kind of be thinking outside the box to be able to stay one step ahead of all these things, if that's even completely possible. However, what I encourage most clients to do is to just be first and foremost, kind of apply that 80-20 rule, but 80% of the time, just be true to who you are and what kind of content moves your business forward and what's authentic and what's accurate to where you are in the process. And then that 20% of the time, if you want to chase the trends or to try to bust the algorithm with something special, go nuts. But as long as you can kind of lean on that 80% and be consistent with it, you're always going to know where you're at. You always have a home. You always have a compass to, to kind of reassess your direction. I've had clients that just chase the trends. Like they're constantly, they have no plan. They're just constantly, I'm chasing the trend and I'm doing something different every day, hoping that it'll, it, that it'll go viral. And it's like, okay, but now you're playing in a very risky place in a pool with a lot of different people. And if you don't have the one or two key variables to make you go viral, you're just completely lost in this process trying to go viral and it's complete white noise. Where at least with the 80-20 kind of concept that I mentioned, you still have this body of consistency that you're building up over time, which also gives you that kind of social credibility that you need in order to hopefully go viral. It's kind of a yin and a yang type mindset that you have to kind of play in both spaces. And I, I think people forget that. They think, Social media has a very kind of happenstance, quick hitting type of vibe to it. But for those who are really good at it, it's dedication, it's consistency, and it's it's time. Like you might see the one post that goes viral with somebody, but you never see the 5,000 posts before that that were crickets, you know? Yeah. So you got to keep that in mind too. But when you're building that plan, I think whether it's an 80-20 or a 70-30, whatever it is, there has to be a, at least a portion of that that's straight up consistent. Yeah, that makes sense. And kind of taking this to the the agency space as we get towards the end of our time. I'm an agency owner. I'm busy. I've got all, not me literally, but also everybody else got all these things on my plate. How do I find that eighty twenty for me? Initially, it's a guess. I mean, you sit down, I mean, it, it's a process of exploration to figure out who you are, what your goals are, what you can, what resources you have to put at it. But that first stab at the 80-20, you're just doing your best to kind of put it on paper and say, okay, here's what I believe it is. Here's what I believe I can do. The next day, the next, whenever it is that you engage on this plan, then it's a working process and it's a living, breathing thing over time to really establish where you can be confident and where you need to evolve and tweak. You know, imagine it like a good fitness workout regimen. You go into it with this idea that I'm going to lose 50 pounds by this time next year and here's how I'm going to do it. That's how you start day one. Day two, you go to the gym and oh my God, I'm sore, but I'm going to come back tomorrow. And you keep doing it and you tweak and you it's just a process over time. But by the time you hit the end of that year, you're probably going to either accomplish that goal or close to it. But if nothing else, you're going to walk away from it with a much broader perspective and understanding as to what it takes to, to lose that 50 pounds or whatever it is. And once you do that over time, I don't want to say it's something you can completely control, but 
it feels like you can because because there's things you can anticipate and there's habits and and executables within there that you know what they look like now because you've done them a number of times. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, Mike. And kind of getting towards the end of our time, I know you have a show as well. Can you talk about that a little bit and where people can go to, to find you? Yeah, we're all over on all the major podcast platforms, specifically Spotify and Apple, um, but it's called Brand Retro with Cyberdogs. And we meet with all kinds of different agency people and Sometimes it's kind of the off the cuff type guest where we talk about experiences and branding and how to connect those dots, but it's really, it's really got a kind of a nice entrepreneurial vibe and we kind of target marketing professionals and entrepreneurs with that podcast. So awesome. Yeah. We'll get that linked up. Thank you, sir. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.